Bronx Assemblyman Carl Heasty. Assemblyman, thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for having me. And uh, this is actually an unusual bill because it moved through Albany with like lightning speed. It almost never happens <laughs> this way. Yeah, comparatively, yes. Um, we introduced it uh, earlier in, in the session, and we were able to get it done. So to to do this kind of landmark policy legislation in one year is a very tremendous um, success. Could you just briefly describe what it is that this bill is going to achieve, and, and also if you have an indication from the governor that it will be signed? Yeah, well, well, basically, well, maybe I should start how what presently goes on. Um, right now, if, a, if an employer is, is found guilty of wage theft, the, the employee is only entitled to whatever wages weren't paid plus a 25 percent liquid, liquidated damage penalty. Right. We've now upped that penalty to 100 percent. And it also stiffens the criminal penalties if the employer is found guilty of, of, doing, of doing these, uh, this unscrupulous uh, um, withholding of wages. So we're talking about really low income. Usually wages are paid to people who are working sort of domestic workers and people who are doormen, for example, people who are working hourly jobs, correct? Right. Restaurant workers, you know, it could be in a car wash, it could be in, in a number of places, probably more than, than we actually realize the different places where this could actually happen. And it seems, though, that it would be difficult to enforce. I mean, of course, everybody thinks that this is bad, but also many people are afraid, perhaps, to, to talk about this. They don't want to throw their employer under the bus because we're talking about an economy that it's difficult to get in a job. So how is it that this will be enforced? Well, there, there are other provisions in the bill that actually allows to protect an employee for, you know, against... Uh, retaliation and what we're actually hoping is with the increasing of the the penalties and the liquidated damages and the now um, the risk that the employer you know him or herself will face will be more of a deterrent um, so that we won't have to have as many employees looking for some kind of redress when this happens why is it though this is a big actually issue for make the road new york and for other um, labor interests of course why do you think that it man you managed to get it moving so quickly through the assembly because really there were so many things that are bottled up and this special session didn't uh, uh, accomplish a, a terrible lot um I, I would say during the legislative session there you know there are a number of issues that come up and um, sometimes they they do take some take priority over, over over others. I wouldn't I don't necessarily mean priority, but you're able to at least get some energy behind and pushing the reason why we needed to uh, to get it to get it done. And I think there was a a, a a big sense in the assembly and the Senate that this was a piece of legislation we had to get done before the end of the year. Was there also an element that there was a fear that perhaps when, when and if the Senate changes hands and goes Republican, that it might be difficult to get that passed on the other side of the Capitol? That was one of the, uh, the, the reasonings, yes. It would probably be a little bit more, more difficult. But, uh, but even for, you know, in, in, our, in our instance, you know, there was Republican uh, you know, support on this bill. So to say it would have been impossible to happen, I wouldn't say that, but it would have been a little more difficult, yes. And what, have you spoken to the governor or gotten some kind of indication from the second floor of the Capitol yeah, that he Yes, I've spoken to the governor. He absolutely intends to sign this bill. Interesting. And, and even, even more to that, he, to allow us to get the bill done before we uh, left uh, Albany, he gave a message of necessity so that we could get the bill to the floor and, and get it voted on. Oh, that's interesting. For those people who are per perhaps not familiar, this is what, it's actually an interesting uh, trick that goes on in Albany, and not always negative, of course, in this particular case, but it enables... Right, I was going to say it... <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say it's, it's not a negative, you know, a lot of times people put, you know, negative connotations on a, a message of necessity, and, 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 and as you said, Liz, and I'm, I'm thankful that you said that, this is one of those cases where it was really done, you know, for the right purposes. It was an important bill to get done. Um, the governor wanted to see it done. My speaker, Sheldon Silver, wanted to see it get done. And, of course, uh, conf conference leader John Sampson and the sponsor of the bill, Diane Savino, Senator Savino, wanted to uh, get it done. So this was a case where the message of necessity helped us along. 
Well, this is also, it enables you to uh, forego the three-day aging requirement for a bill. Usually bills have to, quote, unquote, age. They're placed on the desks of lawmakers, and, and it's to give people a, a chance to read the legislation for people to voice uh, opposition or support for legislation. In this particular instance, that was waived so the bill could be pushed forward in a well, more rapid fashion. Let me give you a, um, a little correction on that. Please. The bill had aged already. The bill was introduced, um, we introduced it uh, uh, in the previous week. So the message of necessity wasn't necessary for um, the aging of the bill. It was necessary to um, allow for the, for the meeting of the Labor Committee to not have 24-hour notice. So the message uh, necessity helped on the committee part, not the aging of the bill. Ah, uh, okay. Generally speaking, though, there was a lot of business that got done in the middle of the night in the assembly, actually way out into the early morning hours. And I'm still sort of confused as to why it is that your chamber likes to meet so late. Because <laughs> the other house doesn't do that. Well, you know, we have 150 compared to um, 62. and. Uh, one of the things, and, you know, I'll, and I'll say this about you know, our speaker, he, he, you know, he continues to be a consensus builder. And so, so Shelley will try to um, negotiate something, you know, pieces of legislation, bills, budgets that you know, try to make everybody's life a little easier. And sometimes I think it's, it's worth it to, uh, to stay there for long hours if in the end we're going to do the right thing. So um, is it difficult? Yes. Do you, are you, does it take a couple of days to recover from, you know, sitting on the floor till 5 o'clock in the morning? Yes. But, um, you know, it goes with the job. Well, and also I think that they stopped doing it, at least under Joe Bruno's rule, because there was a member who, who passed away. He suffered a heart attack, actually, and right. Joe Bruno stopped doing that. You know, I want to ask It's not you, something we, we, we like to do, right. um, but sometimes, you know, it is necessary. I wanted to ask you a little bit, just a, a quick question about leadership. And not obviously, Shelley Silver was reelected by your conference this week while you were in Albany. Uh, with the question of the Senate and who will control the chamber uh, a, a little bit up in the air still, there's a possibility, obviously, that John Sampson will no longer be the, the uh, Democratic conference leader of the majority. And a lot of people have been talking about the sort of fact that there won't be any black leadership after David Patterson, who was the first black governor, leaves. John Sampson, first black majority leader, head of a majority conference, it, it perhaps loses control. And of course, we're seeing this historic moment with Charlie Rangel today. I wonder, uh, you happen to also be the Democratic chairman of the Bronx. Uh, are you concerned about this sort of power drain, if you will? I don't necessarily look at it as, as a power drain. Yes, there's been um, a lessening of, of uh, um, African Americans in, in the figurehead legal, uh, leadership positions, but there are um, agendas that we support as legislators and that the Democratic Party and Democrats in general um, support. So I wouldn't say that I, you know, I'm, I'm con overly concerned. Um, there's a, there's a process. There's changeover. You know, it didn't mean that once David Patterson became governor, that every governor following him should be African American. I think the beauty of the Democratic Party is different races support different agendas, and so I'm I'm not concerned that. Uh, you know, I'm more concerned if, if 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 Senator Sampson is not the conference leader in the majority, but I'm not as concerned that uh, David Patterson not being governor that this is a a. a, a a crisis time for African Americans. I have confidence in, in Governor Cuomo. And you just actually, Governor Elect Cuomo. You were yeah, almost Governor Cuomo. You were you were just actually in a closed door meeting with him. There he had a lunch at the same time that there's all this sort of speculation going around that he's going to have a difficult time working with Shelley Silver and your conference in particular. Can you give us any insight into what happened in there? I think what 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 people always um, fail to realize just inherently. There's always going to be tough times between a, a governor and a legislature. That's the way the Constitution was, was written. That's why we have checks and balances. But I think that there, in, you know, inside the meeting that there was a, a common sense that the governor wants to work with us. We want to work with him. You know, we have uh, you know, a huge um, issue in this $9 billion budget deficit to tackle. And you know, if we're working towards a consensus, 
where you know some of the positions that he wants are incorporated and some that, that we want incorporated, I think it will make life easier. So I think there was a commitment, but I think there's always going to be times where the legislature and the governor are going to have tough times, whether it's the governor of the same party or a governor of, of the opposing party. It's just the nature of the relationship between the executive and the legislature. In parting, I also wanted to ask you about redistricting. You are actually the sure. head of the Assembly Redistricting Committee, um, which has a much longer title, but it's uh, that's for all intents and purposes. Is that is what it is. There's a lot of speculation yes. that the state is going to lose because of its population um, gain vis-a-vis -vis other states two seats. But the more important thing, I think, or more immediate thing, is that a lot of people ran on this idea of nonpartisan redistricting. That was, of course, Ed Koch's crusade. And uh, right. Shelley Silver didn't sign on to that pledge. Do you think that it actually could move in the assembly? Well, I didn't sign on to it either because one of the things that, Liz, that we always have to, to clarify is what does nonpartisan mean? I don't even know if there, that is truly a word. I don't think there's any person that can be put onto a redistricting panel that is not partisan. People have partisan views. Hmm. People have partisan thoughts. Um, so I, and if you take it out of the legislat legislature's hands and you put it into staff people or, or you know, at this point, who knows? Um, you know, I think we really have to look at that. Sometimes our forefathers who put together the Constitution, you know, knew what they were doing. Now, does that mean that um, we couldn't look to improve how um, uh, redistricting is done? Absolutely. You know, there's some, some rules that, that, that we have on the books that me, right now that mean you, you can split a city, but you can't split a town. So there's great difficulties that you have. So can some things be done to do better? Yes. But I'm not sure that I would like to see it totally taken out of legislature's hands. Well, I think that there are a lot of members of Congress who would love to hear that, actually. it's good. That <laughs> is going to be a particularly interesting thing that we're going to be following, and I hope to speak to you again about it. In the meantime, I want to thank you very much for joining us, Assemblyman Carl Heasty. Sure. Anytime, Liz. Thank you.